If there was ever a Mount Rushmore of serial killers, Richard Ramirez would certainly be one of the first to be carved in the rock. The brutality he showed towards his victims, which ranged from children to pensioners, puts him among the very worst of the worst. Richard Ramirez will always be remembered as one of the worst serial killers in American history. Let's profile this psychopath. Ricardo Leva Munoz Ramirez was born February 29, 1960, in El Paso, Texas, to Mexican immigrants Mercedes and Julian Ramirez. Ricardo, who was always called Richard or Ricky, was the youngest of seven children. Richard had a humble upbringing, typical of a first-generation immigrant family in El Paso. Richard was known to hang out and play games with the other children in the neighbourhood, and from all reports, it was an incredibly happy time for everyone. Richard's father was a hard-working man, but a strict disciplinarian with his children. Julian Ramirez moved to America and found work on the railroad, working every hour he could. He had to learn a completely new language, and he expected his children to follow his attitude and ethics. That said, everyone, including Richard, would later report that Julian and Mercedes were excellent parents who did everything they could for the family. It was later reported that Julian was severely beaten as a child, and as a result, he swore he would never lay a hand on his children. As far as we know, he kept this promise. The young Richard was no different to any of the other children in his town. He had a lot of friends in the neighbourhood, and when at school, Richard worked hard and is remembered fondly by the other children in his class. Around the age of five, Richard suffered several head injuries. The worst, when he was knocked unconscious by a swing, caused him to suffer seizures, which would later be diagnosed as epilepsy. This condition would affect him throughout his school life. By age 12, it soon became apparent that all was not well with Richard. He had become distant from his father, who demanded that Richard work hard and contribute toward the family. Instead, Richard grew close and started to look up to his cousin Mike. Mike was a Vietnam veteran who would boast about the many atrocities he saw and personally committed whilst in service. Forensic psychiatrist Dr. Helen Morrison would later comment on cousin Mike Ramirez, saying, quote, The cousin kept multiple mementos of his time in Vietnam and pulled out this box that showed all these photographs of the women he was raping or the heads he was cutting off. It was a fascination. It wasn't recoiling in horror. It was like, wow, look what you've done. So, at the age when Richard's sexuality was being formed, he was exposed to graphic images and tales of rape, torture, mutilation and murder. This exposure would have catastrophic consequences. On the subject of Richard's exposure to violence and the resulting fantasies they brought, Professor Louis Schesslinger said, quote, these individuals are in their fantasy lives from early adolescence, and in some regards, some respects, their fantasy life is more real to them than reality. Their fantasy lives are filled with sadistic aggression, where there's a fusion of sex and aggression. Mike Ramirez would give young Richard a front row view of his brutality. Richard was at his cousin's house, when Mike and his wife got into a petty argument. After a few minutes of bickering, Mike pulled a gun from his belt and shot his wife in the face, killing her instantly. 
this execution would affect Richard, but not in the way that it would have for most people. He wasn't sick to his stomach or appalled. He was fascinated and excited. The world-renowned FBI profiler Robert Ressler would speak about fantasies and how they sometimes start, saying, quote, The fantasies of those that have committed serial crimes have been very carefully studied by the staff of the FBI Behavioral Science Unit over the years and oftentimes are a result of some incident that triggers these thoughts. And once these fantasies become sexualized, it becomes extremely dangerous because they start fantasizing about events of rape, torture and mutilation. After the incident with his cousin, his childhood friends noticed a swift change in Richard. Before, he was easygoing, friendly and approachable, but after, he had become withdrawn and detached. Richard stopped socialising and talking to his old friends and neighbours, and instead, he would hang out with much older teenagers, drinking and taking drugs. It has since been theorised that a lot of second generation immigrants will find themselves getting involved with gangs. It's believed that they see their parents, who have moved countries and have worked hard but have very little to show for it. They believe that it's a disillusioning on their part, almost saying, what's the point of playing by the rules, working hard and sacrificing everything, if this is all you end up with. This is believed to have been how Richard felt. Around the time that Richard became interested in hard rock music and Satanism, he dropped out of school and began living on the fringes of society, where, at times, he could be found sleeping in the local cemetery. During this time, Richard would steal anything and everything he could lay his hands on, his neighbours became aware of this, and they started to call him Ricky the Thief. After Richard was caught and beaten after an attempted rape of a female at a local hotel, Richard moved to California. There, he quickly became a heavy cocaine and alcohol abuser. He lived in Skid Row, which is a hard and dangerous area. He, along with everyone else there, would steal anything they could, looking to make a quick buck for drug money. Richard lived day to day, taking drugs, drinking, using prostitutes, stealing cars and breaking and entering. Richard would often go out to the suburbs, where he discovered that people rarely locked their doors or windows. At first, he would only burglarise the homes that he knew were currently unoccupied, but Richard soon became bolder and bolder. Professor Louis Schlesinger would later say, quote, The vast majority of burglaries are for material gain. These are usually drug people who want to get some money to buy drugs, and they might do it with a friend or partner and so on. But there are a small group of burglars that are sexually motivated, where the burglary itself is motivated by an urge to look a sexual stimulation through looking, and since about 50% of burglaries occur in the evening, when the victim is likely to be home, it's very easy to see the progression from voyeurism to break and entry, to sexual assault or the sexual murder. This was Richard Ramirez to a T. It wouldn't be long before Ramirez graduated from burglar to murderer. Richard Ramirez's first murder was not associated with him until 2009 when detectives tested a DNA sample that was taken and stored some 25 years previous. Nine-year-old Mei Leung was found murdered and hung from a pipe in the basement of a San Francisco hotel where Ramirez was living on April 10th, 1984. May was with her younger brother, but was separated when she realised she had lost a dollar bill. She went back to the basement to search for it, and when her brother returned, he found his sister dead. 
Mei Liang had been raped and then stabbed to death before she was hung half naked on the pipe. No one was ever charged with her murder. In 2009, police were able to test a DNA sample that was recovered from a handkerchief found at the scene and it was a match to Ramirez. There was also another DNA sample on the same handkerchief which makes investigators believe Ramirez was not alone when committing this murder. Although Richard Ramirez has not been officially charged with Mei Liang's murder, the FBI and police are certain that he was the killer. Therefore, it has been added to his victim count. Richard's next victim was 79-year-old Jenny Vincow. Ramirez had broken into her apartment in Eagle Rock, Los Angeles. Originally, Richard had broken into the apartment purely to steal belongings, but he found that there was very little to steal. Enraged, he entered Jenny's bedroom and attacked her. He slit her throat so savagely that she was almost decapitated. He sexually assaulted her corpse before gathering up the slim pickings he could find to sell. Richard was later charged with this murder after his fingerprints were found on a window screen that he had removed to enter the apartment, which was his primary entry on the majority of his burglaries and murders. Shortly before midnight on March 17, 1985, 22-year-old Maria Hernandez parked her car in the garage of the condominium she shared with her friend in Village Lane, Rosemead, Los Angeles. As she got out of her car and went to leave, she heard a sound from behind her. Turning, she saw Ramirez in the shadows, dressed in black, pointing a gun at her. She raised her hands and managed to say, quote, Don't shoot, before he pulled the trigger. The bullet was deflected by a bunch of keys Maria was holding, but the force knocked her to the ground. Richard, unaware that she hadn't actually been shot, savagely kicked who he assumed was a dying woman, kicking her several times in the face. Richard then walked out and into the main entrance to the condo. Maria managed to get to her feet and staggered toward the front of the building. As she caught her breath, she heard a second shot ring out. Suddenly, Richard reappeared in front of her. She pleaded with him, saying, quote, Please don't shoot me again. Richard, in a hurry, ran into the night, leaving Maria terrified but alive. Gil Carrillo, a young homicide detective with the LA County Sheriff's Department, received a call about the shooting and quickly arrived at the scene. When he entered the property, accompanied by Maria Hernandez, they discovered her housemate, 34-year-old Dale Okasaki, dead on the kitchen floor. She had been shot in the face. Nothing was taken from the condo, so officers were stumped on who the killer could be. They theorised that it was probably an angry ex of Dale Okasaki, as Maria did not recognise the attacker. Maria was able to give detectives a good description of the man, saying that he had, quote, dark curly hair, staring eyes, wide-spaced rotting teeth, and a strong body odour. This killing was not linked to Richard's two previous murders for one reason. They didn't follow a pattern. The two victims before were stabbed and sexually assaulted, and this victim was shot, which is an uncommon method of killing for a serial killer. What detectives didn't know was that whilst Detective Gil Carrillo was at the Village Lane murder scene, the killer had already struck again, just 30 minutes after killing Dale Okasaki. In Monterey Park, just an 8 minute drive from Village Lane, 30 year old law student, Sai Lian Yu, had been driving home when another car had forced her to stop. When she exited the vehicle, Richard shot her twice in the chest at close range, killing her. It wasn't until some time later that investigators were able to match ballistics from this shooting to that of Dale Okasaki. 
At the time of the killings, officers had no reason to believe a serial killer was on the loose. A shooting was not perceived as a serial killer trait. On this subject, Professor Louis Cheslinger said, quote, The overwhelming majority of serial sexual murderers kill up close and personal, manual strangulation, ligature strangulation, multiple stab wounds or blunt force trauma. Very, very rarely do they shoot somebody because it's too cold and too impersonal. However, the next murder would cause some officers to start suspecting that they had a serial killer in their community. On the morning of March 27th, 1985, at Strong Avenue, Whittier, the bodies of 64-year-old Vincent Cicero and his 44-year-old wife Maxine were discovered. Vincent Cicero had been shot in the head while he was asleep and the gunshot woke up his wife. Richard overpowered her, hitting her in the face, and then tied her up. After binding her, Richard searched the home for valuables. During his search, Maxine was able to wriggle free of her restraints and retrieved the gun that was hidden in the bedroom. When Richard came back into the room, she fired, but the gun wasn't loaded. Richard was enraged and attacked Maxine with ferocity. He shot her in the head and chest several times, and when she's on the floor dying, he stabs her body over and over again. Before he leaves, he takes a gruesome souvenir. Richard gouged out both of her eyes and placed them in a jewellery box before leaving. The eyeballs were never found. Dr. Helen Morrison would comment on why serial killers take souvenirs or trophies, saying, quote, Many serial killers take souvenirs from the people they kill, whether it's a piece of flesh, piece of jewellery, or something. It is a concrete reminder. It's something they can see, something they can hold on to, something that says, wow, you did this. When Ramirez left the Strong Avenue home, he left imprints of his shoes in the flower bed. Furthermore, later testing would confirm that the bullet casings found at the scene perfectly matched those used in the previous murders. On April 15th, just two weeks after the Cesaro murders, Ramirez struck again. He entered the home of husband and wife William and Lily Doy, who were both in their late 60s. He entered the Trombauer Avenue home in Monterey Park in the late hours and headed straight for the master bedroom. There, he found William Doy in bed alone. He quickly fired several rounds into his head, killing him. Richard then entered the next bedroom, where he found Lily. She slept apart from her husband, as she was physically disabled and required a special bed. Ramirez quickly overpowered the terrified woman, restraining her with thumb cuffs. What followed was several agonizing minutes of torment and torture. He beat Lily, punching her several times in the face, and he repeatedly raped and sodomized her, but shockingly, he allowed her to live. Dr. Helen Morrison would later comment on this murder and the fact Richard treated the male and female victims completely differently, saying, quote, It was unusual for a serial murderer to have two people shooting one and acting like a serial murderer with the other one. Helen continued, believing that the men were quickly killed as they stood in the way of his real target the woman she said quote it was an issue of control it was an issue of not being overpowered what husband or man would lay there and not intervene and trying to keep his partner from being attacked although during the times of the murders police had not yet been able to officially link these series of murders to the same culprit the los angeles sheriff's department strongly believed that they were dealing with a serial killer. 
the issue was, nothing about the murder seemed linked. The victim's age ranged from very young to very old. The weapons used to murder were different. Some were mutilated and some weren't. At the time of the murders, two world-renowned psychologists, one from New York and one from UCLA, told the sheriffs that they had it wrong, saying that one man was not capable of all the murders. They were wrong. Six weeks later, in the leafy city of Monrovia, Richard entered the home of sisters Mabel Bell and Florence Lang, who were both in their 80s. Richard bound both women, tortured them with live wires from a bedside clock, raped them, and then brutally beat them both with a hammer. Both women were found alive two days later, but Mabel died a couple of days later from her injuries. There was yet another difference with this scene. It was the first time the murders were linked to the occult. Richard had drawn several pentagrams on the wall of the sister's home and drew one on Mabel's body. Again, this difference caused more confusion with investigators. However, local sheriffs were still convinced it was the work of one man. Dr. Helen Morrison spoke about when she was brought in to help with the Ramirez investigation, saying, quote, When I was first contacted about the murders, the police were baffled. They had no idea who was doing this, how it was happening. They wondered what type of person would have done this. I mean, was it a maniac? Was it a group of people? Because don't forget, in California they had Charles Manson, who, with his cult, went out murdering an awful lot of individuals. My impression was that it was a single individual. It was someone who was not insane, who was not showing outrageous behaviours, and that he was probably young. He was probably either Caucasian or Hispanic, but he was certainly not a standout in his community. When the media caught wind that there could be a serial killer committing all these crimes, they dubbed Ramirez the Night Stalker. Richard's next attack was not deadly, but nevertheless, it was brutal. Carol Kyle was awoken in her Burbank home, with a bright torch shining in her eyes. Richard forced her, at gunpoint, into the next bedroom. There, her 12-year-old son was handcuffed and locked in a closet. Hearing her son sobbing, she pleaded for Richard to leave, and gave him her diamond necklace. He pocketed the jewellery, and raped Carol. Then, he tied her to the bed, and got her son from the closet. Richard then raped the young boy in front of his hysterical mother. Beginning at the end of June, Richard embarked on an escalating spree of carnage. On June 27th, Richard entered the home of schoolteacher Patty Elaine Higgins in Arcadia. He tied her up, raped and sodomized her, and killed her by slashing open her throat. Five days later, Richard was again in Arcadia, breaking into the home of 77-year-old Mary Cannon. She too was tied up, sexually assaulted, and killed by cutting her throat. Just three days later, Richard was cruising in Sierra Madre when he found an open window. He soon discovered 16-year-old schoolgirl Whitney Bennett asleep. Richard beat the young girl mercilessly with a tire iron. He then strangled her and quickly left. Somehow, Whitney survived the attack and her parents later found her covered in blood. She would have to have several surgeries to repair the catastrophic damage caused to her skull. On the 7th of July, Crime scene investigator Linda Martinez had awoken with a start, hearing someone crying her name. Getting her bearings, she realised it was her elderly neighbour, Sophie Dickman. Linda called back to her neighbour, asking her if she was okay. Sophie called back, informing her that she had been robbed, beaten, raped, and that she was still handcuffed to her bed. Investigators recognised this attack as the work of the Night Stalker. 
Their suspicions were confirmed when they discovered, just a few doors down from Sophie Dickman, the body of 61-year-old Joyce Nelson. She had been beaten to death. Richard Ramirez had struck twice in one night. Fourteen days later, he would repeat the trick. On the 20th of July, Richard broke into a home in Glendale. There, he shot and killed Max Needing. He then killed his wife, Leela, shooting her and hacking her body with a machete. He then drives to Sun Valley and finds a home with an open window. He enters the home and finds 32-year-old Chainarong Covenanth asleep. He shoots him in the head, killing him instantly. He then finds his wife, some kid, sleeping with her eight-year-old son. He binds them both and demands to know where the valuables are. Once he gets the goods, he repeatedly rapes and sodomizes some kid, during which he humiliates her, demanding she swear to Satan. When she is again bound and tied to the bed, he turns his attention to the boy. He rapes the child and demands he hail Satan. Eventually, after some time, he finally leaves. Some kid and her son are left alive. Later, Professor Louis Schlesinger commented about Ramirez and serial killers in general on why they need to humiliate their victims, saying, quote, Humiliation of victims is very, very typical in serial sexual homicide. This is arousing to them. This reassures the offender that they are in such complete control that they can degrade and humiliate the victim any way they want. Nothing could be more stimulating for an individual with this deviant sexual arousal pattern. At this point, the police and FBI were unable to predict or prevent the Night Stalker's crimes. Most serial killers will pick victims who are vulnerable and most at risk, such as sex workers, hitchhikers, or people walking alone at night. But this killer was entering people's homes, killing and attacking everyone inside. No one felt safe, and the majority of the public were angry at the police for failing to protect them. As tensions built in the community, Ramirez was preparing his next attack. On August 6th, Richard entered the Northridge home of Christopher Peterson, 38, and his 27-year-old wife, Virginia. Upon entering the home, he shoots Virginia in the face and shoots Christopher in the neck. Richard ransacks the home and leaves with jewellery and other valuables. Unbelievably, the husband and wife both survived the attack. Two days later, Ramirez breaks into a home in Diamond Bar. There, he shoots 35-year-old Ellis Aboath dead and then rapes and beats his wife. Richard flees, leaving her alive. After this murder, Richard travels north to San Francisco to visit a friend. Whilst there, he commits further crimes. On August 17th, he breaks into a home at Lake Merced. There, he shoots husband and wife, Peter and Barbara Pan, in their heads. Peter died instantly, but Barbara somehow survived. She was able to give police a good description of the killer. Police also found small calibre bullets at the scene that matched the killings in LA. Returning to Los Angeles on August 25th, Richard entered a home in Mission Vallejo where he found a couple sleeping. He shot 29-year-old William Carnes three times in the head. He then tied up his fiancée, Inez Erickson, and savagely rapes and sodomizes her. During the assault, Richard says, quote, You know who I am, don't you? I'm the one they're writing about in the newspapers and on TV. Richard leaves, and Ennis was able to escape her binds and look out the window. She saw that the attacker drove away in a battered orange Toyota. After calling an ambulance, it was discovered that William was still alive. He survived the attack, but suffered permanent brain damage. 
After the last attack, police were finally getting decent leads and tips. Police informants gave officers a rough location of where they claimed the killer hung out and where he scored his drugs. Also, they had the make and colour of the car he drove. Not only that, but a teenager had also spotted a man acting suspicious and took the bother of jotting down the last three digits of the man's license plate, the plate that was on his orange Toyota. With this information, officers went out looking for the car. They got lucky and found the car abandoned on August 28th. The interior had been expertly wiped clean and officers were distraught. However, when officers used a laser scanner inside the car, they recovered a single print on the rearview mirror. Police run the print through their system, which by incredible luck had only just been digitalised, and it came back with a match. The mugshot of Richard Ramirez came on the screen, and he was an almost identical fit to the numerous descriptions given by survivors. They now had their man. The police sent out photographs and a detailed description of Ramirez to every newspaper in Los Angeles and every TV news station they could think of in California. On the morning of August 31st, Richard returned to Los Angeles after visiting his brother in Arizona. He was completely unaware that the police had plastered his face on every newspaper. He went into a convenience store to buy some candy and couldn't help but notice that every other customer in the store was staring at him. When he was waiting for his change, he looked down at the row of newspapers on sale. On the front page of every paper was a photograph of his face. A woman in the shop spotted him and screamed, quote, It's him, El Matador, which means killer in Spanish. Ramirez panicked and fled the shop. He ran behind houses, running through the backyards and over fences. By now, everyone was seeing him and reporting it to the police. The police were now on his trail, following the 911 calls that were coming in. In Hubbard Street, Ramirez tried to carjack a female resident. During the struggle, she screamed out for help and other residents heard and came to her aid. Two men chased Ramirez, who was sluggish after running over two solid miles, and tackled him to the ground. More residents had joined them, and one struck him over the head with a two-by-four. Richard was kept on the ground until the police could come. When police arrived, Richard said, quote, Save me, please. Thank God you came. Save me before they kill me. Richard Ramirez, the night stalker, was arrested and finally caught. While in custody, officers were surprised at how intelligent and well-spoken Richard was. Many had expected the killer to be a raving madman, but they found him to be quiet, smart and articulate. Ramirez also revealed to officers how well-schooled he was in murder, he explained that he had read hundreds of books about murder and serial killers of the past. Officers were shocked at just how much he knew about serial killers. When Richard found out that the cell he was first held in was once used to hold Angelo Bono, one of the hillside stranglers, he had become giddy and excited. By the end of December 1985, Ramirez faced a total of 76 felony charges including 14 counts of first-degree murder and 25 counts of sexual assault. Charging Richard looked to be an open-and-shut case, but he would not stand trial until January 29, 1989. At trial, Richard's attorney entered a plea of not guilty, but Richard did his cause no favour by showing no signs of repentance. He would walk into court with a pentagram drawn on his hand, which he showed when waving to photographers. Once, during the preliminary hearing, Ramirez was heard shouting, quote, Hail Satan, as he left court. Back in his cell, a fellow prisoner later reported that Richard had told him, 
quote, I've killed 20 people, man. I love all that blood. The trial would last eight months, with the jury having to be convened twice. Finally, on September 20th, 1989, Richard Ramirez was found guilty of 13 counts of first-degree murder and 30 other related felonies. Richard was sentenced to death, and when given the opportunity to comment, Richard told the court, quote, You maggots make me sick, hypocrites one and all. You don't understand me. You are not expected to. I am beyond good and evil. I will be avenged. Lucifer dwells in us all. When he left the court for the last time, he walked into the waiting news crews. One asked him for his reaction to being sentenced to death. Richard responded with, quote, Big deal. Death always went with the territory. I'll see you at Disneyland. On June 7, 2003, at the age of 53, Richard Ramirez died, not from capital punishment, but as a result of complications secondary to B-cell lymphoma. He had been on death row in San Quentin for 23 years. During his incarceration, and long after his death, investigators and psychologists tried to find out what had driven Ramirez to kill. Profilers had already written off it being related to his upbringing, as from all accounts, his family were supportive and loving. There is absolutely no reports or evidence of any childhood abuse or neglect, so why did he turn into such a monster? Professor Louis Schlesinger would comment on how and why some people kill, saying, quote, the best way to look at it is from a biopsychosocial approach, but with a heavy emphasis on neurobiology. Whether it's hormonal, chemical, electoral, brain damaged, some combination of facts, plus psychosocial stresses, abuse never helps. Many, many things have to go wrong in order for one of these individuals to be created. Dr. Helen Morrison would also have her say, giving her opinion of Ramirez, saying, quote, Richard Ramirez was born to kill. He began his life the way everybody does, seemingly normal. Something happened in that gene that he has something that was added onto by the experiences that he had in his environment and childhood. It's like a recipe. You have a basic thing, you add to that recipe, and you add to that recipe, and finally, you have the born killer. The consensus for Richard Ramirez is that his experiences with his cousin, what with him detailing the atrocious things he had seen and done, and with him murdering his wife in front of Richard, damaged him mentally, and that there was no turning back after this. Richard was already dabbling in drugs, which would have affected the way his brain developed. Add the hard drugs to his confused, sexually awakened mind, and the influence of his cousin, and you're left with a ticking time bomb that was always destined to explode. My personal opinion on Richard Ramirez is that he was a degenerate junkie whose only purpose in life was to have sex and act out his sadistic sexual fantasies on vulnerable women and children. Also, when you hear about the hundreds of women who attended his trials, blowing him kisses and writing him love letters, and even now, you can find websites and blogs where people are talking about how sexy Richard is. When I hear this, it makes me sick. If you are one of those people... Someone who believes Richard Ramirez is an icon and someone to be celebrated. Then remember this. He is a disgusting serial killer who not only raped women but also young children. He was a necrophiliac, paedophile and sadistic rapist. If you really want to celebrate someone like that, then please leave civilised society and form another one one that will allow you to be as morally corrupt as you obviously are. Thank you so much for joining me on another video. I hope you enjoyed it.
A new Profiling a Psychopath will be uploaded every two weeks on a Saturday evening. Until then, long days and pleasant nights.